So in this video, we are going to talk about measurement. And measurement is very important in science so that when one scientist talks to another about what they're studying, they have a point of comparison for the objects or the events that they are talking about. Just imagine trying to describe to someone how long a snake that you saw in the wild was if you didn't have a system of measurement. One person might have measured the snake in the width of their hands, and the other person might have measured the snake in the length of their feet. And if there's no common system for measurement, then it's really hard to make a comparison between, say, a snake that is too long. We don't know if we're measuring two hands or two feet. And so it's important that we have measurement systems in place so that when we talk about uh, making measurements, we can actually have comparisons between them. And so the system that is commonly used in the scientific community is the SI system of measurement. Uh, sometimes we talk about the metric system as well. And um, in this system, we have what are called base units which these base units are just units that are defined in this system of measurement based on some object or event that is in our physical world. And we have a whole series of these base units. And by the end of this video, you should know and understand the base units for time, length, mass, temperature, and volume. And there's no way of converting between units that measure different things. So we need a different base unit for each different thing that we are measuring. We can't talk about, uh, you know, a snake being 60 seconds long, as second is not a measurement of length, it is a measurement of time. So we're going to go through the base units for each different type of measurement real quick. Most of this is probably reviewed to you, but just in case, we're going to go through them right now. So. The base unit for time is the second, which you probably have heard of before. The second, so second, second, okay. Uh, and we can measure seconds with all sorts of devices that we carry around our pocket in our pockets these days called phones, because our phones have a device called a stopwatch on them. And we can measure time using a stopwatch or a clock or, you know, you name whatever else we can use to measure time with. Our computers have clocks in them. There's all sorts of things. Our next type of measurement we need to make is a measurement of length. And we measure length in meters. Meter is the base unit for length. Meter, M-E-E-T-E-R. The meter is the base unit for length. Sorry, my writing is so messy here. Um, next, oh, and we, what do we measure length in? Well, you probably already kind of know what we measure length in. Um, we measure it using a ruler or a meter stick, which sometimes in the U.S. we refer to as a yard stick because we use the measurement of yards, which is not part of a metric system, but we'll learn to convert between those things later. Uh, you also might have used a tape measure when you were building something or measuring your house or your car. So there's all sorts of things we use to measure length. Up next is mass. Mass is the amount of matter that is in an object. And our base unit for mass is a little tricky. Technically, the base unit for mass is the kilogram. And this is based on a piece of metal that is in France that scientists keep in a vacuum chamber. Um, and that's what we base the kilogram on. But when we make unit conversions, we generally consider the base unit of mass to be the gram, because a gram is basically one mass unit. Gram, okay, and also technically the kilogram. And we measure mass with a variety of things, but most commonly in science class or in a lab, you would use an electronic balance. Um, you know, a while ago, before we had electronic balances commonly, we used something called a triple beam balance. 
which you might have heard of before. You might have even fiddled with at one point or another. But in chemistry class, we will pretty much solely use an electronic balance, which is much faster and much easier to make the measurement with. Um, our next measurement is of temperature. And the base unit of temperature may be one that you are not very familiar with, which is the Kelvin. K E L V I N, the Kelvin. Um, and Kelvin is our base unit. And from the Kelvin temperature scale, we can convert easily into Celsius, which is the other unit that we commonly measure thing temperature in in uh, science class. And then we can also convert to Fahrenheit, which is the temperature scale that we use in the United States. Um, and we measure temperature with a thermometer. That's pretty simple. You've probably used a thermometer many times in your life. And then our last thing that we need to be measuring is volume, or the amount of space that something takes up, whether it be a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Um, and volume technically does not have a base unit because it is technically a derived unit, meaning that it is derived from our base unit for length. Instead of having meters, which is one dimensional, we have meters times meters times meters to get our volume, our length times width times height. And so that unit is derived, uh, but instead of having a meter cubed, which is kind of a large amount of volume, we brought it down to a decimeter cubed, and then we called that the liter, the cubic decimeter or liter. You probably have heard of it before, liter, L-I-T-E-R. That is our base unit for volume. And we measure volume with, well, lots of different things that you may have found in your house, like measuring cups or measuring spoons or even an analogy bottle that has graduations on the side. But in the lab, we use something called a graduated cylinder. Graduated cylinder to measure volume. And then occasionally, we use a device called a pipette for very small amounts of liquid. And our next topic that we are going to talk about is scientific notation. Scientific notation expresses any number as a number between 1 and 10, known as the coefficient, times 10 raised to a power. And you've probably seen this before, but you might have forgotten how to do it. So we're going to review that real quick. Uh, we use scientific notation a lot in chemistry class because you, a lot of the times we're talking about really big and really small numbers. And so we need to be able to express those numbers more easily, and we do that using scientific notation. For example, down here, we have the number uh, 602200000000000000000000000000. Now, do you really want to have to write that number out every single time? No, I do not want to have to do that. So instead of writing all those zeros, we can express this number in scientific notation. So we're going to put the decimal point, move it all the way over from the end of the number until we have a number between 1 and 10. So 6.022000 blah 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 is a number between 1 and 10. So I'm going to write the part of the number before all the zeros start. I'm going to write 6.022 and then I'm going to multiply by 10 raised to some power and that power is going to be equal to the number of times that I had to move the decimal point. So real quick let's count those out in a different color. So I'm going to move it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 
22, 23 times. And so since I moved the decimal point 23 times, my exponent here is going to be 23. And the last step in writing scientific notation is to figure out whether this exponent is going to be negative or positive. And to do this, you want to think back to your original number and figure out if my original number that I started with is bigger than the 6.022 or smaller than the 6.022. If it's bigger, then we want to add zeros, meaning our exponent should be positive. And if it's smaller than the number that we hit, the 6.022, then we want to subtract zeros off. We want, to, we want to move the decimal point the other way, so that would make it a negative exponent. But as you might see, this 6.022 here is way smaller then 6022000000 and so many more zeros. So this exponent, this 23 here, is going to be positive. And we are going to keep 6.022 times 10 to the positive 23rd power. And that is our correct scientific notation. Um, let's try one example where we go in the other direction. What if we had 0.00? .00 2, and we wanted to put this in scientific notation. Well, we need to move the decimal point until we have a number between 1 and 10. I'm going to take this decimal and move it over once. I have 0 0.02, that's still not between 1 and 10. Move it again. Now I have 0 0.2, but that's still not more than 1. So I need to keep moving it one more time. Now I have 2 point. Perfect. 2 is between 1 and 10. So I'm going to write that as my number, starting number for my scientific notation, 2 times 10 raised to some power. And to figure out what power that is, I need to look at how many times I moved that decimal point. I moved it 1, 2, 3 times. So my exponent's going to be 3. And now I just need to figure out if my exponent should be positive or it should be negative. And so here I'm looking at this number that I wrote down. I wrote down 2. And I needed to figure out if this number 2 is bigger than my original number or smaller than my original number. And looking at this 2, 2 is bigger than 0 .002. So that means I need to subtract zeros. I need to move the decimal backward. So I need to put a negative sign in front of my 3. So my scientific notation is 2 times 10 to the negative third power.